Hello everybody at Sun Baptist Church. This is the Lord's Day. I will be glad and rejoice in it. And Marilyn and I are just really, really, really looking forward to being with all of you on the 29th of September. And um, I just can't wait. We're going to have a good time together. Now, I want you to take your Bibles and turn to the book of John, chapter 13. This is one of the most important teachings of the Lord Jesus Christ. And he's sharing it with his disciples. And in the process of this evening talk that he has with them, he washes their feet and he says, this ought ye also to do one to the other. Now, he's not talking about setting up a ritual of foot washing. Some churches have it as a ritual. Most churches don't. I think the correct teaching would be that a church only has two ordinances, and generally those two are the Lord's Supper and baptism, because both of them have to do with the death, burial, and resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ. When a person is baptized, a new convert, they are placed into what we call a watery grave, just as Jesus was placed in the tomb. And coming out of the water is the proof of the resurrection. And then with the Lord's Supper, we have his death pictured with the cup, which is his blood, and the bread, which is his body. But see, in foot washing, as wonderful as it is, and I really don't, I honestly, honestly, honestly don't have a problem with churches who use it as a ritual, similar to the Lord's Supper and baptism, except for one thing. It doesn't picture the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ. It's not a picture of, of salvation. It is a picture of the servant spirit we ought to have once we are saved, if we've been saved. And it's a picture of that. And another reason that most churches don't use it as an ordinance, after this picture of the Lord Jesus washing the disciples' feet, it's never again seen in the New Testament. This experience is the only time in the New Testament that you'll see the picture of the washing of the disciples' feet. Now, when he said, this is something you ought to do too, what he was really saying was, you are not to have a feeling of superiority as a believer. You ought to be humble. You ought to be a servant. You ought to be willing to meet the most menial, even dirty needs of those with whom you come in contact. So then, John 13, after there's been the Lord's Supper and the washing of the feet, the devil has entered Judas and Judas has left. The disciples think, since he's the treasurer of the group, that he's gone out maybe to buy more food, but he's gone. And his mission in actuality is to go to the religious leaders and betray the Lord Jesus and get 30 pieces of silver as a result of it. So now Jesus is alone with his disciples. This is a personal conversation with the disciples. But I am of the conviction that what he says to the disciples, and I'm not going to go into the reason that I think it as a personal conviction, so trust me, I think the things he said to his disciples in this little conversation, this little intimate time together, the night before he was to be crucified. Those things that he said that night, he wants every single follower who will ever follow him 
from that day till the end of time to do also. Now, he calls these people that he's with, these 11, his disciples. Disciples literally means student. You and I are students of the Lord. You and I are being taught by God. These disciples were coming to the end of a three-year time period in which they followed the Lord Jesus Christ. It's been almost three years. Two and a half at least. And so they are here during this three-year period coming to the end of their time with him. In a sense, it's graduation time. They've spent a lot of time with him. So I want you to look at verses 33 through 36 as he begins to teach his disciples. And I want you to think of it as though you and I are around that same table and whatever he's saying to them, he's also saying to us, because in actuality, he is. Do you get that? In verse 33, we're going to read three verses. Little children, yet a little while I, I am with you. Ye shall seek me, and as I said unto the Jews, whither I go, you cannot come. So now I say so to you. A new commandment give I unto you, that you love one another as I have loved you, that ye also love one another. By this shall all men know that ye are my disciples, if you have love one to another. Now in this conversation, now think about it, think about it for a minute. In this conversation, with these who've been with him during the duration of his earthly ministry, the night before he's to be crucified, the very first thing that he talks to them about is love. Not how to survive what's going to happen the next day. Not how to hide out when the enemies of Jesus come looking for them. Not how to build a church, not how to evangelize, but how to love. That's what it's about. And I want you to notice in verse 33, he says to grown men, now, we're, now think about it, grown men, not only grown men, outdoorsmen, by and large fishermen, he calls them little children. Now, a lot of men would find that offensive. They would call them little children. But in my estimation, it was a term of endearment. It was also a term in which he was saying to them, I'm going to be sharing some things that you're just going to have to accept as a little child. You know, if a father is standing beside a table that's three or four feet taller than him or a cabinet, and his child has somehow climbed up on top and he says to the child, just jump. The child doesn't say, well, dad, I don't know whether you can catch me. I don't know if you're strong enough to do it. The child just obeys and jumps. It's a simplicity. And so Jesus, when he calls them little children, is saying, you may not understand everything that I'm about to say. Just accept it as a child. Forget about being a grown man. Forget about what you've heard. Forget about all the things you've read. And may I say to you that the greatest times of spiritual growth in my own Christian life have been those times I've just simply without question as a little child believed 
the Lord Jesus when he spoke to me. I mean, I just believed it. It's the only time in the Bible that you'll see Jesus using that term little children and he's saying it to his disciples. Now he did say, suffer the little children to come unto me. But he didn't directly talk about that and call the little children that. He was saying that again to his disciples about the little children. But this is the only time that he directly calls somebody a little child. Because he want them, those people to just simply believe him. What's the song say? Only believe, only believe, all things are possible, only believe. And so that's what he's asking them to do. And it's the love. Now here are these men, you might say getting ready to graduate. They had a bond between them. Three and a half years. It would be like getting a high school football team together in the locker room. Last game of the season. The seniors have been with these other seniors ever since they were freshmen. Three and a half years. There's a bond there. They'll carry that bond for the rest of their lives. There's just something about it. Or men that have been in war. They've been in foxholes together. They bled together. They fought together. They've been against the enemy together. There's a bond when they come home after that three or four years together that they'll have till the day they die. There was a bond between everybody in that room, including being bonded with the Lord Jesus. And I want you to notice in verses 34 and 35 that four times... He uses that word love. And what he says is, in verse 34, a new commandment I give you. I'm giving you a new commandment. So the question is, for you and for me, and I'm sure those sitting there, a new commandment? I mean, we've heard you at the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus. Maybe you forgot about that. You said a lot of wonderful things. Commands up there galore. You say you have a new commandment? Really? What is it? How do you define it? This new commandment, what is, how, how are we going to show other people that commandment? Well, the commandment was to love. Now, I want you to think about it because he called it a new commandment. To love others. But really, honestly, in the Old Testament, there are teachings about love. For example, and I'm not going to go there, just jot this down somewhere. In Leviticus 19.15, there's a commandment that we are to love our neighbors as ourselves. We are to love our neighbors as ourselves. Now, that is a really high form of love. That was the commandment. In the Old Testament, whatever you would do for yourself, you ought to be willing to do for your neighbor. Now, I maintain that try as we might, we never really get to the place that we love our neighbor as ourselves. And I'm going to prove it to you. If I could get a group of 50 of you in a big room, and I could get a camera and take a picture. And then I could put that picture on a screen so you could see that group of 50 people. Let me ask you a question and you be honest. Whose face would you look for first in that group of 50? I'll tell you, it'll be your own. <laughs> your own face. You're not going to look for your neighbor's face first. You're going to look for your own. Try as we might. There is that, uh, they call it an instinct in your high school classes. It's an instinct of self-preservation. 
and uh, you're going to stay alive if you can. Then, of course, for mothers and fathers, there is species preservation, where you try to take care of your children, maybe, if the house is burning down, and you care more about them than you yourself. But as a general rule, it is really, 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 really hard to consider loving our neighbors as we love ourselves. But that was the commandment in the Old Testament. That was 1,500 years ago from the time of Christ that that law about loving your neighbor as yourself was given. But then he says there is a new commandment that replaces that loving your neighbor as you love yourself. Now let's look at it. He says in verse 34, a new commandment I give unto you that you love one another, but here's the clink, as I have loved you, that ye also love one another. So now we've gone up a notch now. Not to love our neighbors the way we love ourselves. That's high. That's, I mean, you know, the Bible says, greater love hath no man than this, that a man lay down his life for his friend. I mean, that is a high form of love. We call it the, the ultimate sacrifice when soldiers or first responders do it. And that's the truth, it is. But there is even a higher form of love than that. And that's to love people the way Jesus loved them. And how did Jesus love them? Well, he loved them enough to go to the cross. And when he went to the cross, he didn't go there for his country as a soldier might do. He didn't go to the cross because of a son or a daughter that was in trouble. He went to the cross to die even for people who hated him enough, they even nailed him to the cross. That's a high form of love. That's more than loving a neighbor as yourself. That's loving with a Jesus love. It's not only that. He loved patiently. He works with us. Even, even when we uh, rebel against us, he continues to work with us to help us to become everything we ought to become. He doesn't give up on us. I mean, how many times have you rebelled against Jesus, did something that you know he didn't want you to do, and then you asked him to forgive you and he forgave you, and as you were being forgiven, you said, oh, Lord, if you'll just forgive me, I will never do this again. And then you turned around and did it again, but he forgave you again, and again a third time, and he forgave you again because he went to the cross when we didn't deserve it and loved us. He has lovingly our entire Christian life, even when we've let him down, patiently loved us. And during our Christian life, he has loved us unconditionally. The Bible says there is nothing that can separate us from the love of God. Absolutely nothing. That's what the Bible says. Not a thing in the world can separate us from the love of God. He loves us unconditionally. And then he loves us eternally. It's not just for a while. It's going to be forever. I mean, so Jesus said, I got a brand new commandment for you guys sitting around. And remember, we're with the disciples. We're sitting around the table. Judas is gone. He said, I got a new commandment for you. I want you to love one another. Not the way the Old Testament said. Not to love other people the way you love yourself. But to love them the way I love them. And notice he said it's a commandment. It's not a suggestion. And you see, there are some people that treat us so badly, our flesh says, I am not going to love them. Then you're not loving the way Jesus loved. I remember, not all that many years ago, some people really literally 
literally, literally try to destroy me, even conspiring to kill me. One called and repented and said, will you forgive me? I say I've done wrong. I just want you to know I'm repenting whether you forgive me or not. And I forgave him. And I loved him from that point on. I loved him. And wherever that person may be today, if I should see him on the street, I love him. Because we're under a command. See, let me tell you something about love. Love is not real love. Listen, love is not real love if it only matters when it's convenient or comfortable because real love always means there's a cost. Ask a widow whose husband is dead. The reason she mourns is because she loved so deeply. And think about that. If that man had not been loved by her, then she wouldn't be mourning. If you love somebody, there will be a time. There will be a time that undoubtedly, inevitably, there will be a cost as a result of that love. There'll be pain. We had a lady contact our program, some of you know this, whose only child, a daughter, died last week and she was hurting terribly over it. And I, I was able to help her some bit. Well, if she didn't love that child so deeply, she would have never hurt. I remember <coughs> a newscaster lost his 17-year-old son. And I remember him talking to a pastor about it and the pastor said to him, if you had known before the boy was born that you, you could have him for 17 years and then God would take him away, would you still want him? And that newscaster dabbed some tears and then smiled and said, of course I would because I got the memory of so many wonderful times that I would not have had had he never been born. Real love is what Jesus is talking about. Now, we, in our English language, we have to use the same word love for chocolate pie or fish or a certain kind of car or certain kind of sport. I mean, we've got one word. It's a very general word, but that's not so because the New Testament is originally written in Greek. There are four major words for love, not just one word for love, four words. Storge, S-T-O-R-G-E, -E, Greek word, means love for family. Now that's never used in the Bible. Then there is eros love, erotic, E-R-O-T-I-C. That's romantic love or sexual love. That's never used in the Bible. The next two are used in the Bible, phileo, P-H-I-L-E-O, we get the word Philadelphia from it. It means brotherly love. That is used in the Bible. And then the word most often used for love in the Bible is agape. It's God love, A-G-A-P-E. And it is agape that Jesus is using here in this passage when he says, I got a new command for you. I want you to love like I love, and I don't want you to love people like they're a part of the family. I don't want you to love them romantically. I don't want you to love them like a brother. I want you to love them like God. Like God. Now, let me tell you a big mistake people make. In our culture today, we have desecrated God's love. We, I mean, we have destroyed it. We've let society tell the church, you better straighten up and fly right instead of the church telling society, you better straighten up and fly right. Because here's the deal. The Bible is flat out in opposition to same-sex marriage. You can cut it any way you want to cut it. 
It's against same-sex marriage. Does God love the homosexual? Yes. Does God love the lesbian? Yes. But he hates that sin. He does. Oh, but if you're going to be like Jesus, that's an unlovely spirit. You ought to love them. I mean, that's the way they were born, Brother Harold. If you're going to love like Jesus, you, why, you just, no, that's not real love. I want to say this and get it down and clearly get it down. At no time in the Bible is God's love based on what we think, what we feel, or what we choose. Did you hear me? I'm going to repeat that because you need to write it down somewhere. At no place in the Bible is God's love based on what we think what we feel, or what we choose. It simply isn't. It simply isn't. It doesn't matter what you think, what you choose, what you feel about abortion, same-sex marriage, or any other of a multitude of sins. God's love is not based on that. And I'm going to give you perfect proof of it. The most horrible death that has ever been suffered was the death of Jesus Christ at the cross. If society is right and God loves everybody in the world and God loves all the sinners equally and he loves all the sin of the world, doesn't matter whether you're a homosexual or a child molester or a murderer, oh, and the murder God loves. I mean, he loves every kind of sin. He loves it all. Just because you feel like doing it, God says, hey, it's fine with me. I love all it. If that's so, why in the world did he have his son come and die for a world that was already perfect? Want to answer that one? Why did he have him die? If, if we're supposed to love every kind of sin and every kind of sinner. Why did he die? Because far from being a perfect world, it's a very imperfect, evil world, and the only hope people living in that world was to get out of that sin, and the only way to get out of that sin was his death at the cross. Do you see that? Do you see that? So anybody any time comes to you and says, oh, if you're going to love like Jesus, I know these people are living together as homosexuals, but y'all love, y'all love, I love the people. But y'all love them and let them go ahead and do it. And don't, oh, don't preach against that homosexuality. Don't preach against abortion. Don't preach against that kind of thing. That's, that's not being loving. No, it's being very loving. Because of what they're saying is true, then in actuality, there was no sin in the world and there is no sin in the world. So why in the world did Jesus come and die if there's no sin? He had to come because there is sin. And remember this. God's love is not without discipline. Because the Bible says in Hebrews 12, 6, that he chastises those whom he loves. But you see, let me just say something I just said a moment ago in a different way. What society wants to say is that God's love doesn't have consequences. But it does. That's what Hebrews 12, 6 was saying. I love you. But if you rebel against me, there will be consequences, and I will chastise. Love does not mean no consequences. If a parent does not punish a child regularly in proportion to whatever they've done, that child is going to grow up wanting to live 
in a society without rules and without authority. I saw something the other day that just, I thought they don't, they don't get it. The sign of a particular church of a particular denomination outside said, there is no hate here. Everybody welcome. Well, the last part ought to be true. Everybody ought to be welcome. Homosexual, abortionist, moonshine maker, drug seller, whoever it is, ought to be welcome to a church service. But there ought to be hatred for sin because sin is what nailed Jesus to the cross. What that sign is really saying when it says no hate here, let me tell you what it's really saying. They didn't put it on the sign, but this is really what it's saying. You can do whatever you want to and you'll be just fine here. I mean, you're not going to be convicted of sin because we're not going to preach against sin. You're not going to be having to worry about the judgment. You're not going to have to worry about the afterlife. Just come on in. Folks, that is not love. That is not love. So how do we show love? Well, I want you to turn with me to 1 Corinthians chapter 13, and I'm going to hurry because I want you to see this. It's the great chapter on love in the Word of God, and um, some people have it read at their weddings. I've even heard of it being read at funerals. It's a great passage. I want you to listen to verses 4 through 7 because those are really key verses. 1 Corinthians 13. Charity, let's call it love in the King James of charity. Love suffereth long and is kind. Love envieth not. Love vaunteth not itself, is not puffed up. It doth not behave itself unseemly. Seeketh not her own, is not easily provoked. Thinketh no evil. Rejoiceth not in iniquity, but rejoiceth in truth. Beareth all things, believeth all things, hopeth all things, endureth all things. There are 14 things in those verses that love either ought to do or can't do. These are the marks of love. This is how you can show that you love. Now, I'm just going to give you the words, but it's in these verses, if you want to write it down. In those verses that I just read for you, 1 Corinthians 13, verses 4 through 7, if you really want to love the way God loves, and that's what Jesus said, it's a new commandment. This is what he said. So, love is patient. I'm not going to take the time to look at it. We'd run out of time. Love is patient. Don't give up on people. Love is patient. Love is kind. They may be arrogant. They may mean mean-spirited, whoever you're dealing with. But you return their mean-spiritedness with kindness. Love is not envious. Maybe they have more than you have. Don't be envious. Love is not a boaster. Don't brag about how good you have it and they don't. Love does not brag. It's not a boaster. Love is not proud. Have that servant spirit. We talked about it. Love is not rude. Don't mistreat them, even if they're not living right. Don't mistreat them. Love is not selfish. Whatever you do for them, don't do it as because you think you're going to get something in return. Love is not easily angry. It's not easily angry. That's number eight. Number nine, love is not carrying a little black book. Okay, that's what you're doing. I'll owe you for that. I heard a preacher say that his wife was historical. And somebody said, oh, you mean hysterical, don't you? He said, no, historical. She can remember what happened 20 years ago and what I was wearing and what I said and how it happened. She's historical. Well, we don't need to be historical if we love. We should not, if we have true love, not have joy over that person's misfortune. Then we ought to understand this. Our love will protect people that we love. Love will trust 
that they're going to do the right thing. Love hopes for the best for them. And love perseveres. It holds out. Those 14 things are all listed in 1 Corinthians chapter 13, verses 4 through 7. So I hope you'll take a look at them. But Jesus said, love like I love. Love like I love. He was patient, went to the cross, suffered, was kind. I want you to do something. I'm going to do it. I want you to do it. I want you to pick out somebody in your life in the past or maybe in the present. Somebody you just don't like. Somebody that has mistreated you. Somebody that has done you wrong. And I want you to say, Lord, you gave me a new commandment to love like you love. You love the ones that put you on the cross. I want to love that way. You loved with the highest form of love, the love of God. The love of God is greater far than tongue or pen could ever tell. It reaches past the highest star. Can you do that? I want you to get somebody in your mind. You don't have to talk to them. I'm not asking you to do that. I want you this week, at least once a day, to pray and ask Jesus to help you love them the way you know that he loves them. Not like the Old Testament, you're loving them like you love yourself, but love them the way you know Jesus loves them. Can you do that once a day? Heavenly Father, thank you for this time together. Help us to love like you. In Jesus' name, amen.